Thanks, Bill. Uh, kia ora. Uh, I'm Liam McRoberts. Um, I graduated from Victoria in 2013 and been working at Jazzmax most of my time since then. Um, yeah, a bit about myself. I'm in the residential department where we do, we're looking into the alternative housing sector and at the moment we're doing um, a couple of long-term rental projects. One is under construction now in Sandringham and one out in Hobsonville. Um, and in my spare time, I'd like to do other stuff outside of Jasmix. And um, one of them, yeah, this tiny house that i um, been designing for my brother and his partner. And I thought I'd name it another tiny house because you, you sort of get one of two reactions from people. And that's, oh yeah, cool, it's a, you're doing a tiny house, that's awesome. How big, how small, what's it clad in? And the other, the other one is, oh, another fucking tiny house. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you buy a real house? Um, so, but I'd like to the other way. Yeah, step back a little bit and sort of um, pick up on where Andrew Maynard was talking about with, um, at, the, at the start of the series on um, housing and as a culture how we view it and primarily in Western culture we view housing as a um, commodity and if we go back to how that's um, come to arise is through politics and we've had 30 to 40 years of um, the neoliberal agenda of viewing housing as a commodity and um, the separation of housing not being del delivered or part of the government and it's really it's open to the market and it's really important to note that the market has never solved the hous a housing problem um, if you look at countries overseas in Scandinavia, um, France and Switzerland, they have fantastic alternative models where, um, for example, nearly 50% of Germany uh, rents and 30% um, of Zurich's population um, live in uh, a co-operative housing model. So, um, and really this means that we live in a society where, um, as architects, we, um, our clients are developers and their, um, their bottom line is how many how many housing, how many units can you get in one building? And um, that is the two bed, one bath model primarily, and you end up with um, ship at sugar tree and um, disorientated cul-de-sacs. And uh, yeah. And also yeah, we, we, know, we know about the homelessness and this is what, this is one of the um, outcomes of viewing housing like this. And it's also um, where we have, we live in a society where there's now the working poor, where we live in a low wage economy and there's this desire to get on the property ladder, um, but you can't afford to pay your mortgage and you've got two or three kids and um, one wants a stay at home uh, parent. So, um, it's all pretty grim. Uh, my brother, this is Sean on the left, um, he lived in Japan for uh, almost three years and I went over to see him a couple of times and sort of took, it, took him on a tour of some of my favourite uh, projects by so Fujimoto and um, Sana and uh, uh, Takemitsu Azuma. This is his um, tower house, which is a beautiful example of our, the footprint is 20 square metres. It's five storeys high. Um, that's where he worked um, and he lived with his wife and, and daughter. So beautiful examples like this of um, really intense um, micro housing, which is just designed for um, you know, your needs. And the, and the image in the photo is his apartment, which is sort of a typical Tokyo apartment where I think it's 25, 30 square meters. Um, and you, um, you would have to hang up his washing over his bed and you know, you just learn to adapt. Um, but Andrew Maynard said, yeah, it is sort of inhumane to um, cram people into these tiny houses because, and he's right to a degree, we do have to, we have to live um, smaller, we have to um, stop building these massive McMansions um, and tiny housing isn't for everyone and there's definitely cases where tiny housing hasn't worked for everyone, um, it's in the media. But so it's important to yeah, think hard about what you, what you really need, um, what you don't need um, and but yeah, building within your means. So, really start to think about it. Start um, sketching. Volume is incredibly important, and one thing that kind of arose out of um, 
doing these sketches is that you taking the idea that you could um, you're sleeping and uh, living could be sort of one space, not too dissimilar to how they how they lived in Tokyo. Um, so the top plan is um, I guess I guess the the ground level, which is the the kitchen dining area, um, with the bathroom at the back, and then you go up to ah yeah sorry there's um storage cells which are above that is the the bedroom and the idea that you would f they, they would fold up the bed um, a futon bed and that then transforms into an extended living space um, which is shown in the plans below and then above that is a small resident uh, mezzanine and storage space which could also be another hangout zone as well so in section is sort of if you were to do a um, a rim cool house diagram is a um, if to get yeah, compartmentalize the different the, the program and then so it is about it's it is about maximizing your volume and the the volume is your biggest amenity if you're you're going to live small uh, so a little bit of detail on the construction. Um, there's two ways you can build a tiny house, and that is within the 2.5 metre width, which is um, the sort of the caravan dimensions. And if you go past that, so the maximum you can go is 3.1 metres wide, um, that's then classified as a live load. And that means that you have to take, the tiny house has to be able to be taken off the trailer um, with ease. And this actually works in benefit because you can take the house off and then put it on piles in the future. And often the way that they're done is that this is done is by building a second fully galvanised steel trailer, which is going to add to your cost. And um, it also slightly it does raise the the level of the, of, of the house, so you have to step up further into it. So actually, a friend of mine in Wellington uh, built his like this, where that top deck is made of timber. And then, um, so so 190 joists, and they're all individually bolted to the trailer. So, of course, it's a little bit cumbersome when it comes around to taking the tiny house off the trailer. You're going to have to go around and unbolt every single one. But um, you know, we save money, and it's lighter too. So there's a three and a half ton weight limit to the tiny houses. Um, you go beyond this, and you need to get it towed by a um, yep, larger vehicle. So then we filled in the gaps with polystyrene for insulation, nice and green, um, and then built a plywood uh, deck over that, which we then used to set out the framing, the wall framing, and just one by one, building them, building them on the deck and then erecting them. And then the frames are tied, um, the bottom plates are tied down, um, just bolted through to the um, top deck. And then, typical um, bit of a, didn't quite realise that we, we needed a bit more bracing. So we um, went through and added a whole lot of dragon ties and um, a lot more logging. Um, getting the building wrap on, scaffold is, you're definitely going to need a scaffold if you don't have somewhere to, um, yeah, you've got a, a covered shed or something, you, it's, it's really, really helpful. Um, and, I'm sure health and safety wise as well. Um, so there we are cutting cutting the corrugate without any earmuffs and <laughs> yeah, um, and adding way too much um, air, um, yeah, air seal around the windows. And yeah, so we did the cladding and the window joinery. So it's all it's all clad in um, corrugate steel. And we did try to we attempted to, to do this all ourselves with um, pain and agony, and so during the process, I definitely um, have a newfound respect for uh, metal roofers, and um, it's it's a real craft actually. And you realise that there's a number of tools that you need, which you just you can't pick out from your dad's garage. Um, so the left hand yeah the left hand image is. 
um, yeah, I guess the f almost the final result of um, when we were close to um, cladding it. And then we had one of the guys come around that was measuring up the flashings and he, he took a bit of a look at our flashings and he said, oh, that's definitely not waterproof, mate. <laughs> so we, um, yeah, start from scratch. And we actually, we hired some contractors to come in and, and finish the cladding to great expense. And, but um, it's an important lesson and you, def you can't um, do everything by yourself, um, even, even if you're trying to save money. So there's a classic architect build a relationship. Um, I would send my dad these, these sketches and dad would glance over it quite literally and take out his big um, timber mallet and just start whacking the frame to get it square. Um, but the, the lesson is that you, you really do need to seek help if, you, if you're not sure. Um, it's, it's, it's really important to know, to, to seek the, people, um, for, the right people for advice. Um, and then, yeah, so on the left-hand side was some, yeah, some renders that I did for my brother and his partner. And on the right-hand side, of course, the house looking at the moment. So we've just had the uh, electrics done and the plumbing done, gas fitting, and that's how it's looking now. And I think, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Liam. Liam McRoberts. Um, so I will just escape this, and then our next um, our next speakers, uh, Helen Jarvis and Ellen um, C. Simpson. Hello everyone, um, my name is Helen and this is Alan and um, give you a little bit of background information on us. Um, I graduated gra with a graphic design degree from Unitech uh, in 2013. About six months after that uh, we started a digital fabrication studio together on K Road called Make Shop. We do laser cutting, large format printing, CNC, 3D printing, that sort of thing. We started with a student base because we just graduated and we knew a lot of students um, for most of our customers and then we slowly merged into um, architectural firms coming in, artists and you know creative individuals from around K Road. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Alan. So um, I studied a Bachelor of um, Architecture and Masters here at Auckland Uni. Um, then I graduated in 2016. Um, so the reason why we're here today to talk to you guys is because we are going tiny um, we're going to build a tiny house and um, the reason why we're going to build a tiny house is because um, it allows us to have creative control over the design and also um, it allows us, uh, gives us the opportunity to build it ourselves, which we are, and also um, it's also an affordable solution to the um, prices of housing these days, so that's why. And um, so just running, just want to see um, a show of hands for anyone who is currently building or interested in building, uh, designing a tiny house. Just want to... Oh yeah, cool, that's awesome. So um, hopefully um, our talk here today will be um, um, insightful um, about legalities and our design and also um, inspiring. So I'll just hand it back to Helen and she'll be talking about the legalities. Cool, so I'm going to run you through legalities of tiny houses and then Alan's going to speak to you about our design. So just to put the legalities in context, because I will be speaking about legalities within the context of our design, um, this is the design of our tiny house and this is the site for our tiny house. Um, so the site is my grandma's front garden for now uh, until we can afford some land, if ever, <laughs> in Auckland. Um, so we're back from the road, it's a great little site, it's very private, although we do have five neighbours who we have been very nice to. <laughs> Alright, so the three main things I'm going to be talking to you about is resource consent, building consent and road legal vehicles. So I'm going to be talking to you about the legalities that surround this. It's really just like a, um, a springboard for you guys to go out and do research if you're interested in doing a tiny house. So 
these are going to provide you with some helpful insights into what you might need to look into. So we start with resource consent. So resource consent is the official permission to carry out an operation that has environmental impact. So when you're putting your tiny house on a site, you most likely will require resource consent or that you may need to approach the council about resource consent or you can just fly under the radar. But um, so resource consent in terms of a tiny house is dependent on many factors. So there's zoning of your site. Um, there's things like coastal erosion if you're near the coast or, you know, less specific things like just how much room you need outside your front window. So um, the best place to start is the unitary plan. If you have a site in mind, you can look it up on the unitary plan um, on the um, government's website. Yeah, I'll send the links at the end. But um, basically, this shows you what zone your site will be in. And each of these zone have, zones have different requirements, or they'll tell you how many dwellings you can have per site, that sort of thing. So there's a few different zones. We're in a mixed house uh, suburban zone. No suburban. <laughs> okay, and just to be clear, so within um, the resource consent and the unitary plan, a tiny house is considered to be a building or a dwelling. So resource consent and building consent have two different definitions of what a building is, but within resource consent, your tiny house is considered to be a building. So these are some of the considerations from the unitary plan that we have had to consider within our site. Um, things like building height in relation to boundary, outlook space, yard controls, landscaped area. So these are some of the regulations that are set out to make sure that the space on your site is used uh, correctly and that your neighbors are not getting you know, um, shadowing or anything from your building. Um, other things that were considered in um, our resource consent when we talked to the council were things like floodplains, land instability, um, coastal stormwater areas. Um, so these, this is our actual, um, our actual result from the council and they said that basically we do not need a resource consent, which was very good. <laughs> so this is our site with the considerations of the unitary plan. So we have a height in relation to boundary area, which is about two meters from all of the fences. Our outlook space, which is six meters by four meters outside our main, uh, our main living area. And then we've got three meters by three meters outside our main bedroom area. All right, so building consent. <laughs> this is the evil bit of tiny houses. <laughs> um, so building consent is the formal approval uh, granted by a building consent authority for building works. And it basically means that your building must meet the code, building regulations, and the New Zealand Building Act. Um, so this is a gray area in terms of tiny houses, mostly because the council interp interprets the Building Act quite differently from how we tiny house builders interpret it. So to be clear, and this, uh, this area gets a bit confusing, so I'll go into it in more detail, but according to the Building Act 2004, a vehicle is a building if it meets both of the following criteria that it is immovable and occupied by people on a permanent or long-term basis. So if it does not meet both of those criteria, as many ha tiny houses do, then it is not considered to be a building, and therefore it will be exempt from the building code, building consents, and development contributions, which is what we want. <laughs> All right, so um, this is a determination. This is a, this is a diagram from determination, and a determination is um, a final kind of ruling on whether or not a tiny house is a vehicle or a building. You can access determinations online. Basically, if the council comes to you and they say, this tiny house is a building, and you say, no, it's a vehicle, um, you can go to this authority, which will grant you a determination to determine whether or not it is a vehicle or a building. So the first thing to consider is, is it a vehicle? Uh, in terms of most tiny houses, they are built on trailers, they're on wheels, they can move. Um, they're drawn or propelled by mechanical power. So majority of tiny houses, yes, they are a vehicle. If it is a vehicle, then you need to consider two criteria under Section 81B3 of the Building Act, which is, is it immovable and is it occupied by people on a long-term basis? So basically, for it to be considered a building, it needs to meet both of these criteria. 
If it only meets one of these criteria, then it is not considered a building and therefore it is exempt from the building code and all of the costs associated with building consents and etc. <clears throat> the best thing to do, uh, and best advice I can give you, if you are building a tiny house or if you're thinking about it, just love your neighbour. <laughs> Bake them cookies, get to know them, talk to them about what you're doing because these are the people around you that are most likely to call the council and complain. Um, so you really want to be on their good side. Um, so road legal vehicles, all right. Uh, these are defined by the New Zealand Transport Agency and basically tiny houses are often built either on a light trailer or they're built on a light trailer with an over dimension load. All right, so light trailers, these are the easiest to define as vehicles. If you are fighting with the council, this is the route you want to take or you think you might have a nasty neighbor. Um, so basically a light trailer has a maximum width of 2.55 meters. Um, maximum length of 12.5, maximum height of 4.3, and a maximum weight of 3.5 tons. 3.5 tons is the, the, the clincher for tiny houses because it is very hard to stay within that weight limit. So some people want to go a little wider than the 2.55 because um, you, know, you just want a bit of extra width so it doesn't feel like a corridor. Um, so the best width to go to after that is up to 3.1 wide. So this requires no pilot vehicle and no permit. Basically, you're able to do this, if, um, like Liam said, if it is considered a load on a trailer. So it must be detachable from the trailer. All right, so if you are interested in doing a tiny house or building or looking at a site that you are potentially interested in putting a tiny house on, I would recommend probably take a photo of this and go to all these websites to do uh, a little bit more digging. So check your zone and the resource consent considerations for your specific site. Uh, familiarize yourself with the wording of Section 8.1 of the Building Act 2004. Check previous determinations by the MBIE. So basically just search vehicle in the determination section and you'll get a heap of determinations, some with positive outcomes, some with negative outcomes. Um, look into the limitations of trailers and loads, fact sheet 13D and 53A on the New Zealand Transport Agency's website and establish a good relationship with your neighbours. All right, now on to Alan with the design. So for the design of our tiny house, um, we wanted to push the boundaries of a standard tiny house aesthetic um, through form and materiality. Um, so for our trailer, we went with a 3x9 um, removable deck trailer. So it's actually built so the deck is removable. Um, uh, so we went with this size because um, we've actually stayed in a few tiny houses which are roughly about 2.5 by 7 metres. And um, personally we felt that was a bit too small for us, so that's why we went with the 3x9. And um, this trailer in particular um, weighs about 1 tonne total. And so you can probably tell that um, keeping to the 3.5 tonne limit um, with a tiny house build on a lightweight trailer is going to be quite challenging. Um, but so technically our trailer has three axles, but this photo show, um, this image show, um, shows only two. Um, so it can actually support up to 4.5 tons, but we're going to try our best to stay to the 3.5 tonne limit, which is um, set by the NZTA, um, the New Zealand Transport Agency. Um, and as you're probably aware that the, um, the limit was not intended to accommodate um, the weight of the house build. So we're going to um, be building our tiny house out of um, structurally insulated um, panels, sandwich panels or sit panels for short. Um, so a sit panel is, um, it consists of a core which is a foam, typically EPS or PU, um, sandwiched between two um, bits of wood or metal. In our case, we're going to go with um, aluminium skin sit panels um, because they're the lightest option because we're going three by nine. Um, we have to be quite strategic with the materials we use because um, that could get quite heavy pretty quickly. Um, and also you can see it on the bottom there that um, it shows that the weight of like a traditional timber frame building with cladding compared to an uh, aluminium sit, um, sit panel building um, at size 10.8 by 3 metres by 3.5 is roughly like five times lighter than a, than a typical um, timber frame house build. So. Um, for our, for our design, we wanted to, um, interior, we wanted to keep things minimal 
and effective to allow it to feel spacious um, while still being quite um, practical as a living space. So our interior only um, consists of very few, uh, very few built elements. So as you see, there's not much to do, um, not much built elements inside. And um, so we created a utility hub which houses the fridge, the pantry, the kitchen storage, uh, the bathroom cupboard, and um, a backdoor storage room. And because this utility cupboard is not full height, it also doubles as a like a floor standing height space beside the mezzanine bed, um, and it's for accessing the wardrobe and the underfloor storage, and it's also kind of like a changing area. And for the mezzanine, we've raised the floor to achieve a sunken bed to integrate in some um, underfloor storage, because in a tiny house, like space is quite key, so you want to utilize the space as like, strategic as possible and effective as possible. And um, you can see that um, moving between floors, we've chose to go with stairs as opposed to ladders because, um, because of practicality. Um, also because we go on five, uh, three meters wide, um, we had the space to do it comfortably. Um, we also designed the stairs to be multifunctional. So um, you can see that we've ergonomically tweaked um, the stairs between the mid floor and the mezzanine to also be like a reading nook or space to sit and just use your laptop. And also, um, this stairs has built-in storage, so that then again, it's like being effective with the space you have. And so, um, our living, uh, our kitchen um, flows into the living living area, which is all double height space. Um, and you can see in the back there, there's a bit of screening there, which separates the zones, but still allows the space to feel um, open and um, connected. So with, um, with the roof design, we went quite um, unconventional. We enjoy the aesthetic of a gable roof, but we like the practicality of a flat roof. Um, so after a few iterations, you can see there, um, we managed to come up with a hybrid um, roof line, which satisfies the three minimum um, degrees uh, runoff which um, starts as a gable at the double height end, but merges and, and graduates to a flat end at the mezzanine end. So yeah, with the roof being homogeneous layer, you can get the same language inside with the ceiling. So um, you get this sort of um, beautiful undulating quality of um, geom geometric facets, which we hope will create an intriguing and um, intriguing and interesting space to be um, living in inside the tiny house. So in terms of um, the spatial arrangement, um, we have uh, double height space where the living areas, we want it to be open and um, facilitate social gatherings and um, um, as a social interaction space. But as you move towards the back, that recedes to a more quiet and intimate um, alcove-esque kind of space for the bedroom. So yeah, that's our tiny house design. And hopefully um, we provided some, um, Helen's provided some insightful information and inspired some of you to um, think of tiny houses as a viable option, option um, as for housing. And um, we're going to be documenting, documenting the whole build process. So um, yeah, if you're interested, feel free to like, follow us on Instagram at MadeTieNZ. So yeah, thanks. And um, yeah, feel free to ask questions afterwards if you want to. So thank you, Helen and Ellen. And can we just bring up the next one? Uh, so our next speaker is Pete Ubel, and um, Alan Johnson is partnered with you on this, but he can't be here tonight. So. And what's the first one? Um, it's the one. Yeah, the one to the left. Oh. Yeah, the one helpfully labelled fast forward presentation. <laughs> okay, that's it. Yeah. That's the microphone. Yeah, thank you very much. That's your clicker. So just forward it in. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Kia ora koutou katoa. My name is um, Pete. And like the last two, I built a tiny house. We did it. Um, but before I get into that story, uh, I need to sort of reframe, um, need to tell another story just to sort of frame the problem. Um, now, everyone knows about the uh, homelessness crisis that's going on through New Zealand. I mean, it's been through the media for the last couple of years. Um, but the degree of that is probably not so clear to everyone around. Um, the homelessness, we have uh, currently 1% of our population is homeless. Um, 
and that's increasing. Between 2006 and 2013, um, New Zealand's population grew by 5%, but the homelessness uh, population grew by 25%. Um, and the, the current rate of homelessness in New Zealand is the worst that we've seen since World War II. Um, in those days, they set up a tent village in uh, the domain to deal with it because it was an emergency. And we've kind of got a still similar situation. It's not getting better. Um, but like the, the wider housing problem, there are many factors to deal with it, different ways that we need to sort of work out, various social and health problems, etc. Um, and the government are sort of working their way to dealing with that. Um, well, we'd like to think. Um, but uh, I mean, they've just announced the only last week uh, 200 million to contribute towards um, dealing with this epidemic we have, um, which is amazing because it is actually the single largest um, investment in homelessness that we've ever seen in this country, um, and that's great. Um, and then we looked at Auckland Council, and uh, I mean they're they're doing all right. They're um, uh, but they're relying more on the the housing first um, situation, which was actually set up by government. And the housing first um, policy, the housing first uh, model, it's it's great. It's good at sort of readjusting, getting people off the streets a bit. But even they agree that there is failings in it. And the main failing is they don't have enough houses. And it's like the rest of us, like Kiwi Build, then we can't build them fast enough. We don't have enough houses, and we need houses to put these homeless people into. So um, we took matters into our own house, and we built a house ourselves on council land. <laughs> um, it started with a small group of us um, working with the Auckland Housing Association. Um, we got together to design and build uh, a house um, and we used voluntary labour. We started building in, um, in Ormonston Junior College using their workshop. We prefabricated all the walls and set it all up. Um, and then we transported it to a vacant piece of council land, which is conveniently located right next to the Manukau Police Station. Um, and we got about 50 skilled, I mean over a couple of days, we had about 50 skilled and unskilled volunteers who came and helped us build. Um, I think there's at least one of the volunteers currently in here today. Um, and it was, a, it was a great time, great community, so atmosphere. We, we came together, we sort of ate together, we laughed together, it was, it was good. Um, and so the whole idea was, was conceived to show that we can address the homelessness crisis through community and innovative solutions. We, we can actually come together, this is our problem, we can solve it together. Um, and so we, we worked together, we, we, it, was a, it was a good effort. Um, and so just moving into the design of it though, um, it was a 27 square metre house, um, which uh, unfortunately, we couldn't deal, because of the nature of the tenants and the people living in, and the homeless people, we couldn't really, they didn't really have a huge amount of storage, but we also couldn't use the innovative sort of storing solutions. It just wouldn't work with the, the type of people that were going through there. They weren't, they're not in the, the best state of mind at that stage in their life. Um, but we, we have a 27 square metre um, building, which is designed as a, as a temporary solution. People, uh, it's, it's a, it's a staying location for people to come off the streets, get them back on their feet, and then get out um, into the, the proper housing market. And you, you'll find that there will be different tenants going through it. There will be, um, be it young teenagers who are coming off the street to a mother and a couple of kids, to a couple. Um, it can house a, quite a range of people. Um, the, you can see we've got a, a bedroom which is allowed for reconfiguration, um, a kitchen dining, bathroom and a, an exterior storage, exterior services sort of corner which is designed so that um, the people managing the tenants can also manage and, and deal with all the services because it's actually reasonably high tech. Um, the house is portable on chassis, movable on wheels, although our prototype actually wasn't. Um, and we, we used a lot of sustainable tech to try to, um, try to make the house as autonomous as possible. Um, the, uh, the idea was being that if it was moved around, if it was sort of, if, if, if needs to be, it could shuffle everywhere. It's not dependent on the grid, it's not dependent on connecting into things. It can run off um, the solar panels and the gas valve on, etc. Um, and we also um, dealt, we built with the um, tenants in mind. Unfortunately, we built with ply interiors. Um, <laughs> 
but that was uh, in case things get damaged. We also um, gave configuration for people to be able to re-modify it to make it take a bit more ownership of it, have pride over their house. Um, we, we've got furniture from Ormiston Engineering College, the students built furniture, and we did this all with a budget of 50k. Um, and the idea is that it serves as an example of prefabrication techniques, of sustainable technologies, of community coming together to, to solve the problem. Um, and as I said, the, 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 the house is just a temporary solution. It's a stopgap. It's, it's there as a five-year solution to bear the brunt of the worst of the crisis going on at the moment while other social factors get slowly resolved um, just to get people off the street as much as we can. Um, and so the house was originally conceived as a demonstration demanding more from our governments, um, be it local or um, central, to address the situation. And so, but, so that means we had, we had three goals. The dream had three goals. First one was to, to build a house, um, and we were successful in that. It was a house that can actually house homeless people, and it is uh, buildable by other local communities, um, by far now, all across the country. It's, it's a reasonably easy copy and paste sort of situation. Sure, you have to alter to deal with coastal areas and so forth, which the previous presenters pointed out, but there is a lot of things you can just sort of reconfigure. Um, we, the second goal was we wanted council to come to the table, and this is the big one. We needed, um, the key, one of the key areas with housing in Auckland is land, and all through our city, there's a whole lot of land that Auckland Council owns, be it um, through different arms, be it Auckland Transport, Panuku, et cetera, that is currently being not used. It's zoned for, um, for future developments, for future project, uh, transport projects, but it's not currently being used at the moment. And, and some of it doesn't even have a, a, future, a future designation. Um, and so we're asking, look, can we just put our houses on there for a couple of years and they can be shipped away? Can we sort of house people there? Can, we, can you come to the table and help us? Um, we're also asking council to also come to the table with some of the consenting and um, connection issues. Um, but there's different ways of getting around that. Um, and the third thing is we wanted to inspire, inspire ordinary people to sort of have a run at this themselves and, and be innovative, um, work out solutions. And, and you can see with the tiny houses we've got here that on display tonight, people are trying to think of solutions to their housing crisis. And these are the things that we want out of the city. The market, as Liam pointed out, isn't solving the crisis. We kind of need to come together as individuals and do it as well. Um, so what's, what's happened since? Um, we moved the house to, to Pui Maro, um, where they're using it to house homeless people. Um, they've got a set up at the moment with some rented cottages that they've got government funding for. And, um, I don't know if you guys know about them, but they were uh, quite vocal and quite big advocates a couple of years back about the homeless situation where they were literally taking families off the street and, and housing them because it's, it's, it's the adult community and it's their duty to do so as a, as a marae. Um, and so we've given it to them. We've donated it to them. We, we didn't give it to them completely finished. It's, uh, it's taken a bit of work with a lot of volunteers just finishing it up at the last sort of stages. Um, you can see me sort of shoveling there quite gracefully. Um, but it needed to be done. Um, and so this was our prototype. Um, it was a proven success that, that worked. And we are looking to scale up. Um, we were looking, aiming for a 10 in the first year and moving up to a program um, that works up to 100 or so a year if required. Um, now, the, the Auckland Homeless Survey that was undertaken uh, last year found there were 800 rough sleepers on the streets at the moment. Um, the scale of which is actually worse, but that's just what's in the, on the streets. And now if we, if we had a, even a dozen of these units slowly circulating through those numbers, we'd make a significant dent pretty quickly. And so that's all, that's all it takes. It just needs to get these people off the streets. Um, and so we, we got this house, the government, we talked to them. I had good phone calls with David Parker and Twyford and so forth, and they were very excited. They, they liked the idea. This is where it's going. We talked to people underneath them. They were excited. Um, and so we, we moved forward and we, we tended, we found a contractor who could build these things within budget, pre-consented, and they also um, they could scale it up to as big as we needed. They also used um, uh, prison workers to be able to upskill them, to get them a trade when they left prison, which is a win-win. It was all working out that way. 
Um, we had a project management firm lined up, we had engineers lined up, everyone was sitting there all set to sort of go on this, They're all, that was all budgeted. Um, life eyes were in place to manage the tenants when they come through, everything's going. Um, and we wrote our business case, presented it to the government, and of that 200 million that I spoke earlier about, 100, oh, 1 million of that was earmarked for us um, through the, urban, the Ministry, of urban Housing, ah, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. We got our money, we got the budget, we can, we can build. Um, thank you. The houses, everything was ready to go for the houses to be rolled out um, in time for the winter. But, <laughs> but, remember when I talked about uh, Auckland Council? Despite a lot of meetings at Council and, and a couple of quite intense meetings with Chris Darby and so forth, um, Unfortunately, that was the, the response, the, the, the final answer that we kind of got with them. Um, it, it doesn't fall within their strategic intent. They're not, they're not being brave to sort of try to work with us on this. Um, I mean, the Auckland Council had its own planning meeting on the, uh, on the 5th of March. They, they, you know, they voted in the meeting to intervene and lead in the homelessness situation. But currently, I don't feel they're doing that. Um, and so we, we, we're asking for political leadership from them um, to fulfill a role in the build-up uh, proposal. I mean, we, we've, we've been working with them. We're, we're, it's, it's gone. It's happening. Um, but we just want leadership. Um, and if, if, it was a, if it was a budgetary issue, I would, I would understand their reluctance. I mean, but they're not providing the money. They just need to sort of come to the table. It doesn't cost them anything. Um, so at the moment, it's just about where our political leaders put their emphasis, what their, what their priorities are. Um, and so, look, we, we can address the homeless crisis with innovation, with different solutions. We can do it. Um, but where does that leave us now while well, we wait? Um, do, we, do we go back to demonstrating and demanding more out of the leaders? And I think that's a good thing. We should always do that. Um, or do we go back to building houses on council land? I'm doing it illegally, because I, if I had my way again, I would have left normally longer. Um, but let's see, we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Local government, election year. <laughs> and our final speaker tonight is uh, Tommy Honey. What is this? How do I do that? It's four. Uh, yeah. Sweet. That's four. And there's one more. And it's just in the third arm. Yeah. To start, I. <laughs> Hi. I left my third arm at <coughs> home tonight. I'm not going to have to turn the pages. Hi, I'm, to Hi, I'm Tommy Honey. Ooh, we've got, we're going. It's great to be here this evening. And as you can see, I hate tiny houses. <laughs> but uh, more about that later. Let's uh, start with the granny flat, particularly the confluence of semantics and regulation. Granny flat is the term for an accessory building placed on a homeowner's site, usually to accommodate one of the owner's parents or grandparent of their children, hence the use of the word granny. Its first known use was in 1965. Prior to that, we kept our parents closer to us and allowed them inside the house. <laughs> the rise of the nuclear family post-war led to the stratification of generations and the presence of grandparents in the house was a th threat to the nucleus. At the same time, planners, such as they were, and politicians feared intensification and the idea that people might profit from their land. The thought of a second dwelling on a site threatened the quarter-acre dream of one site, one house. The planning solution was to create regulations for an accessory building so constraining that no reasonable person would want to rent one but we would have no compunction housing our parents in one. <laughs> Fortunately, we are more compassionate towards older people now. Perhaps we've moved them out of the house 
and now we've moved them out of the backyard into retirement homes, which are really just a collection of granny flats jammed together with tatonk. <laughs> so, changing behaviours drove need, which led to regulation designed not to permit these behaviours and needs, but to constrain and control them. So it was, and still is. Regulation lags behind social change and lingers like a dead fish on a summer's day. And we're gone. <laughs> I think that's the time. Is it drinking? <laughs> Is it this? Has this gone to sleep? Oh! oh. I may need to step in. Um, the tiny house movement is a reaction to these lingering regulations and it looks for a loophole big enough to drive a house truck through and lands literally on wheels. To avoid compliance with council rules and regulations, as we've heard already, you put your tiny house on wheels, which defines it as relocatable or removable. But a critical consequence of this wheeled independence is the impact it has on the design of the house, particularly its width. Given that they're designed to move on roads, they are usually constrained to a width of less than three metres, as, as we've heard. And for me, this gives rise to spatial solutions that their owners claim are compact, but I think are in reality just foolish. The layout of the rooms or activities become linear and difficult to navigate or traverse. For millennia, our domestic architecture has taught us that rooms should be designed around people and their interactions. Tiny houses are designed around the width of a road. A floor plan of six by seven metres is habitable. I say one three by 15 is not. Tiny houses then are the house trucks of the new millennium. For people who can't afford to live in a potato. <laughs> For me, I'm not interested in tiny houses that do an end run around regulation and create a roll-on, roll-off, off-grid solution in the middle of the grid of the city. If that's you, go for your life. Compost your shit to your heart's content. Mine's heading down a pipe to a sewage prong. I am interested in living small. I am interested in backyards. And I love prefab. I'm also curious about why there's been no real disruption in housing, and I'm concerned about the rising cost of land in the housing equation. So how can we disrupt housing? Uber makes use of an underutilised asset, a guy on a couch with a car in a garage. Airbnb makes use of an underutilised room in your house. Where is the underutilised land in the city Apart from golf courses, backyards. Every home has one. How can we access this land without buying it? We lease it. Slimby stands for shared living in my backyard. Slimby places a prefabricated house on land at least from a homeowner, the host, funded by an external investor, and tenants it with a suitable tenant, the resident. And this is how it works. Slimby connects the potential users and manages the process of delivering the prefab. The host and investor have a commercial lease, the investor and the resident have a residential lease. Where land was the problem, here it is the solution. The high cost of land is mitigated through a flexible lease process. The prefabs are sourced from established off-site manufacturers in New Zealand. Last year, Prefab NZ held the snug competition for a prefab that could go on a backyard in Auckland. There were 86 entries, 12 finalists, and six winners. You can see all 12 finalists on the snug website, and they're great. It's a fantastic, innovative design there. Because the challenge of building small, and Slimby is no exception, is the dead weight of regulation. I'm going to get pointy-headed here now. 
There are two development fees if you're building permanently on your site, not on wheels, that you have to take into account in Auckland for all new builds. Watercare charges an infrastructure growth charge, the IGC. In the metropolitan area, this is a flat fee of $11,680, reduced by a third if your dwelling is less than 65 square metres. So I'm looking here at two houses, one that could be a million dollar development or one that's $100,000. So 10 times difference. So if you build a million dollar house, the fee is at about 1.2% of the cost of your house. But if you've got a 100k prefab under 65 square metres, it will be 7,800 or 7.8% of the cost of your house. It only drops by a third. You must also pay a development contribution to Auckland Council, Council which is on a step scale. For a million dollar house, this is around 28,000 or 2.8%. And so if you're a 100k prefab, it's about half that, 13,000 or 13%. So the total development fees for your million dollar house is about 3.8% of your cost. But if you want to build small, before you're out of the gate, you're up for $21,000, 17% of the cost of your house, of your project, simply for the right to build, even before resource or building consents. It's such a perverse disincentive to build small. With Slimby, the project, the business I have, that money actually has to be paid by either the homeowner or the investor and then recovered from the tenant, which pushes the rent up, and that's not the goal. So while we're addressing these uh, challenges with Slimby, we're exploring, oh, I just, in this graph you can actually see the difference in the, the, the scale of those development fees on the left, the million dollar, on the right, the 100k one. So with Slimby we're exploring other ideas that we might be able to spin off. I call them the Slimby descendants. And this moves the idea to slightly different territory. If I can put one prefab on a backyard, why can't I put two? Or three? Well, regulation and zoning, of course, but there might be a way to do this. Um, civil war, find a zone where it could happen. But in doing this, I've become really interested in what I call micro-co-housing of about three to six dwelling units. Now, co-housing, which and very well served by this lecture series, usually involves 12 to 20 dwellings and it's often on new or cleared land. But if you use a site with an existing house and just add a few small units, the proposition becomes much, much more interesting. So what could you do? Uh, is that my time? <laughs> what could you do? Intergenerational housing. And this is something I think that we're going to start to see a lot more of. You install your adult children in prefabs on your backyard. The first one to have a family gets the big house and the parents move into the prefab. <laughs> you could stretch the idea further and have four prefabs catering to extended family, what I call a kind of a suburban papakainga. But what about, and I have to say this is my favourite idea, a DIY retirement village. It's a boomer of an idea. There's only so many of us in the room. Now, the minimum number of units required by legislation for a retirement village is two. Yes, so you could put one prefab in your backyard, call both of them a retirement village, and, and adhere to that legislation, and you're on your way. But what if you take four couples approaching retirement? They sell their houses, find a suitable property with a modest existing house and a big backyard, I'm looking at you, Onihanga, and build four prefabs to live in, each with their own facilities. The existing house is converted to have a kitchen and dining area for shared meals, a library for their collected books, a screening room, a spare bedroom for grandchildren and other visitors. Come in, grandchildren and other visitors. I think we've, we've gone, it's gone to sleep. What, do I do? what did you do last night? This one? Sorry, maybe this is one of that. Can you try doing it? I just removed it using this. <laughs> this idea is so revolutionary, even Microsoft hates it. <laughs> PowerPoint oh, is not responding. Hang on while Windows is not This This might take several minutes. We're drinking. We're just going straight to the drinking. Oh, well, at least we said. Here we go. So, uh, 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 uh,
Yeah, do, 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 no. uh, 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 14. 13. Alright. Document recovery. Oh, I feel <laughs> like it. <laughs> it's a soap opera. <laughs> <laughs> My next tech startup is about how to solve this thing where every lecture you go to, this happens. I'm just going to tell you the idea. So, I haven't got much left anyway. I'm nearly there. Uh, so, and uh, the last room you'd have is a medical room in this, uh, this, this house that you're refitting. And, uh, and in that, someone who's in, living in one of the prefabs who might need greater care and attention because they're older can get that on site without having to go to a rest home or a hospice or some other place and and to be able to do that on site within with living close to the people that they have shared in the shared property is a huge value you could I can do someone else's presentation. You could even do two sites together with two houses and put six prefabs on and, and merge them. The only thing that stands between us in doing this is, there we go. Sorry, is this going to work? From current slide, slide show. No, it's just solo. It's just a wedding. <laughs> no, no, so it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. The only thing that stands between us is the regulations that lag behind the social change. And urban designers and planners they're great at following rules, they're a little nervous about changing them. But that's what we do come election time. So what we have to do is think about what are the ways that we want to live and tell the council and tell planners what, that we want to do this and not, that they don't need to be scared of the changes that we, that we want to deliver. So let's stop giving our savings to Ryman and MetLife Care and instead give them to each other. Let's change the world one backyard at a time. We don't need wheels, we need ideas, imagination, innovation, and intent. Thank you. So I'm so sorry we fucked you at the That's last all right. moment. <laughs> I feel, I feel a weekend symposium coming on uh, in relation to not just tiny houses, but, you know, everything. Uh, we've got a government that is committed to doing things at the moment, uh, and they are doing good things, but I hope you all found this session very stimulating in the sense that we need to do more to empower people to do it for themselves. And we need to get a little bit more radical about the way that we look at things. So um, there are a whole bunch of drinks uh, and nibbles out there at the moment. Uh, we couldn't get the barbecue platter for some reason, so it's going to be pretty vegan, but that means it's not falling down. So quite the opposite. Um, so we've got time for a few questions for five minutes or so. So um, first up. Uh, anyone like to ask a question? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes, it's working. Okay, so who was that? Thank you very much. So the question is about what's happen if you don't qualify to be poor enough as a homeless uh, or if you are not wealthy enough to buy um, land and uh, you are determined not to pay rent. Personally, I believe in two things. I bought an ambulance and a camper van. One is my dining room, the other one is my bedroom. Waiting for the right time to come, what I believe is an, an occupation and determination. But um, if anyone believes in a, that kind of activism or any other solution. I guess that's probably going to me with the homeless. Um, that is a hard solution. Um, I, I can't speak for council in terms of how they manage that. Am I getting an echo? No. Um, but I would say 
I mean, you, you have to demand more. I mean, it's, this, is a, this is a thing that we, we have actually reiterated in a few of our um, speeches is you've got to demand more out of council and ask them for what, what, what is possible. You're in, a, you're in a tight bubble here. You're in a, a middle ground here um, where you're not poor enough to be on the street, but you're, you're not wealthy enough to build your own house. Um, and this is a, a financial situation. I'm sure there are sort of ways of going about this, but... I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure of the solution there. Um, let's get out there and actually build a house, I suppose. <laughs> yes, hi. Tommy, um, could you elaborate a bit on the arrangement that involves the commercial lease and the residential lease and how that um, is uh, what advantages that has in terms of regulations or otherwise? Sure. So the Slimby model, Slimby.global, if you're going, um, uh, essentially I, I discovered that the, if, you have a, if a landlord has a million dollar house in Auckland and you rent it, only $200,000 that, that is the house. And if you're the tenant, you're paying 80% of your rent goes to that land. And so I'm uh, interested in the rental situation. So the cost of land, which goes back to actually our previous speaker, that's one of the biggest barriers, whether it's land supply or regulation, whatever, it's driving land cost up. When your, when your CV goes up, it's not the house that's increasing in value, it's the land. So how do you mitigate that? You lease it. So then you've got to work out how to do that. So if you're going to lease off someone's backyard, you only want a portion of it, you've got to define what that is. So the homeowner has a commercial lease, as you might, uh, and they, as I think it's a maximum of 35 years, can lease that land. So that, that the only relationship they have is about this commercial lease for that land. The investor becomes a landlord and must, if an outside tenant is going to live in that, must be, it comes under the Residential Tenancy Act. You cannot escape that unless it's a retirement village. So, um, so the idea is that the, uh, the ecosystem of Slimby are those three parties. So the tenant would actually pay money to the Slimby website, who then distributes it to the homeowner in a lease cost. They get a return and, and on their piece of land, and the investor gets a return on their money. So the, the challenge is that the weekly tenant's rent has to cover both of those, and the investor's money has to cover the cost of the box. So that's the picture of the way it works, and that's why the two leases are different. The, the, the issues go in a slightly different direction. The regulatory ones are there because of those uh, um, uh, compliance costs before consents. Uh, there are issues around that banks get concerned about having a second building on the property, and if the homeowner uh, um, goes belly up, they're going to try and take that box away that belongs to someone else. So they're, you know, lawyers love this issue because all they can see is disaster. Um, so do bankers, all they can see is an opportunity. So, but, but I don't want to let them get in the middle of a great idea. Yes. Can I go back to the question over there for a second? Um, so in terms of um, the cost of land, you were talking about and you don't want to rent necessarily. Um, so there have been some tiny house builds that are in New Zealand that have been very low cost, I think about $25,000, which, I mean, it does seem like a lot, but it's an affordable amount compared to other situations. Also, um, talking to a lot of people online, they've been able to find uh, places to park their tiny house where they don't actually have to pay lease or rent to park it on the land. They just do um, chores around the house or they keep the maintenance of the land or they are stock watchers for cattle. Um, so basically, you can find um, cheaper solutions, but it's you just have to kind of put yourself out there and ask around in those community groups. Um, Landshare.co.nz as well. There's some cheaper rents on there. Um, yeah, so look into those cheaper solutions. <laughs> um, these are great projects if perhaps there are not too many of them I just wondered what would happen if it really really took off as an idea about the balance between green space and impermeable surfaces if we're getting rid of lots of gardens or indeed council parkland um, how do you think about that? And where does the poo go? 
Where does the poo go? How does the plumbing work? Mine's in a pond. Uh, to answer your second point, mine was a, it's chemical toilet. Um, but I agree that tiny houses aren't the solution to our housing crisis. We, we shouldn't be sitting there planting tiny houses in every backyard and every possible solution. I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying, Tommy, but it's not a one solution fits all. There, there needs to be density, there needs to be other sort of situations. Um, ours is an emergency, my project is, is an emergency situation. It's, it's five years just going in there, taking off the brunt of it, clearing it away, we've got this land free. And these aren't, I'm not saying put these houses in the middle of the lane. I mean, I'm not saying that there's, there's plenty of little sort of lots in the middle of cul-de-sacs or next to railways or so forth that are being used. And you can have like a, a community of sort of four or five houses in an area that's safe and easy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we've got a, my brother's got a composting bullet in his, so you, know, you can check it on your veggie patch. But um, Tommy has hit it on the head where... It's crazy that we're building these tiny houses. We're building a, a part vehicle, part dwelling just to get around these, these rules. And we do have to intensify, and we have to intensify so intensely that um, we have to live, we're going to be living closer together. But these models where if we, if we can bring together um, long-term tenure and safety of tenure um, at, at, at a capped rent um, as well, which is a very real possibility, and it will be part of um, the um, solution to New Zealand's um, housing shortly. Just, to, just on the, the, the waste issue, the composting toilets work for poo, but there's a bigger issue with grey water. Uh, your sink, your shower, your hand basin actually can produce a lot more water to deal with, and you can't just pour that onto the ground outside because it's either got to go find its way into the, the, the drainage system or you've got to have a solution for that, and that's often overlooked. And you might be okay if you're in an area that is much less populated, but within an, an intensive urban area, you're actually uh, more likely to get tripped up on that than any of the other issues you've solved. I have a two-part question, both around planning loopholes in Auckland specifically. So my first question is, to anyone who cares to answer it, am I correct in interpreting the presentation as meaning that if one meets the light trailer vehicle requirement, one can put a tiny house pretty much anywhere one likes? And my second question is, uh, is are temporary buildings also a loophole? Can one get around the um, planning restrictions by picking one's building up every two years and moving it three feet. To speak to the tiny houses specifically, the ones that are on wheels and you can move around, um, y you can put them a lot of places, but you do need to adhere to the unitary plan. So you do have to have all those considerations. I mean, people who park them uh, in a driveway, they're not adhering to the unitary plan. And if the council was to approach you and say, hey, um, this is not working, you're going to need resource consent and you're not working to the unitary plan. Um, personally, I think it's better just to work to what the regulations are. Uh, so you can't really park it anywhere, but you can think about where you park it and you can look at what the regulations are to make sure that you know, you're know you not intruding on anybody's sunshade, you know, whatever. Yeah, um, yeah and it does depend. Some councils in New Zealand, like Taranga, for example, is really conservative. And they've been, um, you know, with a tiny house, they've given them eviction notices and uh, finding them 350 a day sort of thing. So, you, yeah, your best bet to, is to, um, you could build it exactly like a caravan and it's exactly, you can remove it as you, any time you like. Um, and also, it was, it's not exactly built like a house as well. So there's an argument there where you haven't followed 3604 and you followed um, the caravan build guide. Um, it's good also to look at determinations. So there have been a lot of cases where people have had a, a temporary building or a, you know, a, re a removable structure, but it's not necessarily a vehicle. Uh, therefore, it's deemed a building, and then you would need to work to all of the consents. Um, so, yeah, have a look at the determinations to see where people have gone down the path where there's no return and what has been accepted. Sorry, I'm going to have to cut a talk because we've got papers outside uh, and we'll run out of time. Um, but thank you. Uh, we know before you all get up and run for a drink, um, uh, I 